Okay, hello everybody. Here we are, session eight or nine. I have a little bit lost track of the numbers. And um, we are getting toward the end, and we'll probably finish today with what is called the realistic worldview, which is the first of the Eightfold Path, the first branch of the Eightfold Path, as you will remember, which is kind of interesting because, for example, in the transcendent virtues in the Mahayana, the sixth virtue, or the sixth transcendent virtue, or sixth transcendence is that of wisdom. So wisdom, and wisdom is sort of the goal because it is wisdom that liberates you from suffering. And that's where you find your freedom, is through wisdom, because you realize you're in essential freedom, let's say. And um, so, but here in the, in the fundamental teaching Buddha gave to the first kind of student, uh, he begins with the reason, wisdom, because a realistic worldview has to do with wisdom. Because the, a worldview, it is a belief, but it is not an irrational belief. The Buddha was different from what you think of as religions in that he didn't want people to have unrealistic beliefs that were sort of, they had to just be kind of fanatical about them because there was no real evidence that they were accurate or correct. So you're believing in something that you don't know, you can't verify whether it's true or not, and you're just sort of stuck with it. And he didn't think that was good. He thinks if people posit a fundamental irrationality in their life that cripples them, from trying to figure out what's happening and becoming more realistic about the world. So he thought we should have confidence in our reason and we should learn to use it critically and effectively to see through nonsense and to discern unreality from reality. Or even though ultimately it might be that the final experiences that we can have as a scientist even somehow reaches, reaches to the ineffable, reaches to the inexpressible, reaches beyond computation and calculation and conceptualization and becomes a kind of direct experience that you can't really put into words. And in a way, you can see even simple things, eating an apple or, or an apple pie is a kind of simple experience where, in a way, you can say, I ate an apple pie, you can say it was delicious, it was like this and like that, it was made with this and that, you can do all kinds of detail about it, but the actual experience of eating that pie is beyond your ability exhaustively to describe. You know, the chemistry of it, the molecular biology of the apple, you know, the whole thing it's just, it goes off into inconceivability, you know, and besides the sort of poetic, juicy pleasure or the frustration with a slightly tart taste or some defect in the apple. You know, this is all beyond um, precise encapsulating description. On the other hand, knowing that it's a good apple versus a poison one, knowing this and that about it doesn't hurt the broader beyond words experience. But it's just that the, the words should not pretend to capture the experience. So reality is like that even in the most common level. And so from that we can infer that if there is such a thing as a fully enlightened, fully awakened being who really knows reality like molecule by molecule, subatomic energy by subatomic energy, you know, uh, dark matter, dark energy, transparent matter, transparent energy, totally knows that, that they would say, that, well, I can't describe it, you know. Any theory we'll have will be a kind of a doorway. You can look at it, look look through, you can go through, but no doorway will be the place. No description will be the place. So there's no dogmas. Okay? So here we have realistic belief. If we say that without dogmas, what does that mean? It means that no belief is final, absolute, or fixed. It means that any any particular analysis or description of anything that we make is only relatively true, even though it could be about actual reality or truth. But the description will only be relatively true in a certain, from a certain perspective, within a certain context and so on. So that means that the realistic worldview is open-minded view, open view. Therefore, observing things in their specificity and experiencing them 
at the very, to various degrees of intimacy and even not tuness, where subject and object kind of have a merging type experience, which is again beyond description. How can that be? I'm the one having it. How can I merge with what I see? So this is the sort of thing. So anyway, that's where we are, and it's, but it's considered really important. So it's the first branch of the Eightfold Path. And, and one of the reasons is, in a way, it's very easy and very obvious to understand conceptually so we can have an inference about it that makes sense. And the easiness of understanding conceptually is that um, all final descriptions, if you will, are negations. So that things are not this and not that is all that one is saying. And a negative cognition is kind of an opening cognition. There's no elephant in the room, okay? You would say, based on the evidence of having examined the room and not found an elephant. You never do find a non-elephant. You just fail to find an elephant. And that is the cognition of the lack of elephant, which in a way is not, it doesn't interfere with you seeing everything else in the room. In fact, you have to see everything else in the room to realize there's no elephant among the things, if you follow me. So it's very commonsensical that the absolute would be the freedom, the free emptiness, emptiness or freedom, that everything sort of dissolves under analysis when looked for as a fixated, self-subsisting thing. And, um, and your failure to find that itself is the freedom from the freedom. <laughs> When you're looking for the thing, you fail to find it. It dissolves under analysis down to the subatomic particles, down to the energies. And if you uh, look at the non-thing, you won't even get started with that because it's a nothing. It's not there. So your negational awareness of freedom from a sort of intrinsically real presence of the thing that you see as if it were intrinsically real that is a sort of a state of separation from the thing, in a way. But then, if you want to look for it, it's that separation, some sort of states of separation, and you look carefully at that, then that will also dissolve under analysis as a thing in itself. So you'll be still left staring at the things, looking like they're real things, and they're actually only illusory things. It's like when you see your reflection in the mirror, after you grow up, you realize there is no third person, no other person in the mirror through a window in a three-dimensional room, as it looks like, someone who looks sort of like you, if you know what you look like. You realize that's not the case, but you can still look and see the reflection in the mirror. You're knowing that it's not what it seems to be, it doesn't prevent you from seeing it as it seems to be, right? simultaneously with kind of correcting it. <clears throat> so you know it's just a reflection in the mirror of yourself rather than yourself, yourself. <coughs> yourself itself, so to speak. So all of these examples and the understanding of the, of the sort of the, the reasonable investigation of, of what a negation is, what kind of cognition is a negative cognition? Like there's no more soap, there's no more air, there's no more water, there's no more this and that. And then then what that kind of cognition is? It's different from, oh, there's the sink, there's the soap, which seems to reaffirm the intrinsic reality, the inherent existence of the sink and the soap. It seems to be, but when you say there is no such thing, and when you analyze it to find out where is the real soap, where is the real sink, and fail to find anything down to the subatomic level, quantum level, then you are free. And this is a scientific thing. So, you know, you're not used to the idea in our West, we're not used to the idea that, that thinking critically like this is scientific. Being rational is being scientific. Scientific should connect to common sense. It may use abstruse languages like mathematical languages or symbolic languages of various kinds, but they're all, all languages are symbolic. So they are all only a take or a perspective on some reality. They never capture it. So that's really key to be aware of that, okay? 
And if, you're, and if you do that, then there are so many inferences about the fact that the way we habitually perceive things is that every single thing was a thing in itself, as a philosopher might call it, is an error. And actually, things are only there insofar as other things are related to them. Like the screen of the, the, of the monitor in front of me is made up of atoms and molecules. And at the quantum level, nobody knows what it's made out of, which is why all spiritual people nowadays talk about quantum this, quantum that. Because that's the gap, that's the weak point in the seeming seamless control and a hold of physical reality that materialist scientism pretends to. And then when they hit that over the micro, super micro quantum level, then they can't have nothing to grasp onto. And they come up with all kinds of crazy things crazy expressions to try to describe the condition of not being able to hold on to something and yet know it's there. But this is the purely relational way of relating to it, and this is what Buddha discovered, and this is what emptiness means. Emptiness means that all of the relative things are empty of any non-relative essential components or parts or pieces or anything, and they're pure relationalities. And therefore, they seem to be things in themselves, however, and therefore they have an illusory quality. Okay, so let me now go back to it from the book after giving you that summary. So just to be in summary, a realistic worldview is open-mindedness. And open-mindedness is not like just a state of like cleaving your skull in half with an axe or something where you become unconscious. Because there you're, un you're not open-minded because you're unconscious. In a way, you're mindless. But to have a mind but be open about it means that you're just observing things. And you're not pretending you pre-know them. So you can see always new dimensions in them. And so you relate to them more carefully, sensibly, sensitively, and responsibly, and responsibly. And that, that's where then wisdom produces compassion, love and compassion. But that's a further step we'll get to. And now just talking about the wisdom. And so that means that the, the maximum sort of the, the almost seemingly dogmatic thing they will say is, you have to kind of accept causation. But on the other hand, you know how to interfere with causation. You know, om ye dharma, going back to that, which I think we already just discussed, but om ye dharma, or whatever things there are, om ye dharma hetu prabhava, who are manifested through causes, show themselves through causes. Uh, uh, om ye dharma hetu prabhava hetun tesham tathagata hi abadat. The realistic one, the transcendent realistic one, Buddha, he uh, said, what are the causes? He spoke to those causes. Okay. And he also spoke to how they cease. So somehow going beyond being stuck there, he also mentioned, you can read it that way, the limitations of the re intrinsic reality of any cause is what that means. You know, in that sense, they cease in the mistaken way of perceiving them. But however, if, you're, if your final worldview is open-mindedness, you will then observe things in their interrelating processes of causation, is the idea. Making you more observant and more present in, in life, actually, rather than exterminating you in some way, which is how Buddhism has been misunderstood which I will explain more. Okay, well, now let's go to the text. At this stage, we already read a bump out of it. I may be repeating part of this, but it bears repeating. Buddhism is real. The heading here on page 27 is Buddhism is realism, not religion as defined today. So that's, I know, a hard sell, and people won't really get that. But it is very heartfelt and very, very reasonably arguable. Okay, all this is to say that Buddhism isn't so much a religion as a worldview. And then I'm using worldview, I could say belief, but then that would fit right in in people's ideas of dogmatically controlled fanatical beliefs, which is supposed to be the province of religion. Since religion has been sort of reduced in its size and role by the new religion of scientism, as well as the proper pursuit of, of, of um, you know, uh, uh, observational, data-driven science, 
is also dogma in prison scientism. And all of those have reduced the roles of other of previously what were called religions. And religio comes from Latin religio to bind up again, to rebind up, you know, repeat a binding. A ligo means lig like ligament is to connect something. And so you're connected. Originally, it meant, in, as a Latin word, whatever was the religion of your ancestors. It didn't mean particularly Christianity or anything. It meant whatever you inherited from your ancestors. That was what you bound yourself up in again by carrying it on to the next generation. And then after Christianity became the religion of the Roman Empire, it only was Christianity and any other thing was paganism or ignorance or superstition or whatever. And it's still anathema today, any other religion, to any dogmatic religion. <clears throat> Just like science has become, scientism has become a dogmatic religion, in fact. So, um, so when Max Weber was doing a kind of phenomenology of world religions, for example, he couldn't. He he said founders of religions are prophets, like like Muhammad, Jesus, uh, the the Jewish prophets, and uh, so of course Jesus is claimed to be more than just a prophet. But the Muslims see him as a prophet, and the rabbinic Jews also saw him as a as a kind of prophet, and. Um, but Christians then deified him, and that's that's what they also too. That, that can be there's a way that can have meaning for people. Uh, but the point is that Weber couldn't fit Buddha into the role of a prophet, even though even with the little information he had about Buddhism from Sri Lanka, pretty much all he had, he didn't have Mahayana Buddhism from East Asia or from or from ancient India, and uh, so. Uh, he considered Buddhism to be very sort of otherworldly and so on, but yet the founder was not a prophet. He was not de retailing or he was not detailing or, or professing that God would save everybody if they believed in God or even he would save everybody if they believed in him. He said, I can't save you, but I can coach you how you can understand your saved estate. So that made him... This. So then finally he said, well, he's not an emissary prophet like sent by God, he is an exemplary prophet. So by his example of how to live and how to waken up your higher intelligence, he becomes like a prophet by, the, by which he meant a founder of a world religion. But then, but then Buddhism's uh, faith thing is very much not the case. And so, and it really means the only way you'll get free of suffering, your own salvation, will be your understanding of yourself and the universe. So in a way, you have to release yourself through investigating life and investigating yourself. And then the great encouragement of the Buddha to people, which made people want to follow him, was if you do that, you'll come up with success. You can understand yourself. You can understand the world. When you do, you will be released from suffering. So in a way, they're all teaching a kind of salvation. But, but Buddha is kind of unique in teaching it sort of like a secularist, that you will be saved by understanding. So then begins realistic worldview. So what is the open-mindedness required to move you to want to understand? That's what he's, that's what we're at, talking about now. Right? So, His Holiness the Dal in conversation with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, he and I worked out a fun formula that Buddhism, while highly spiritual, for sure, in the sense that it deals with this very subtle, with the, what is the materialist would consider the unseen, is only maximally one-sixth a religion, like the one-sixth aspect, since religion is currently defined as a system of ultimate beliefs and associated ritual and moral behaviors. While Buddhism in practice consists of the three super educations in ethics, mind, or psychology, and wisdom. Ethics, mind, and wisdom. Ethics, is, so, that's, so it's an educational system, actually, rather than a belief system, Buddhism. That's, that's completely different, right? Ethics is based on the reality of interpersonal action. In other words, helping and not harming others. And of course, the, the shocker there for Buddhism is you can help and harm with your mind. 
you certainly we know that you can do so by saying things helpful or harmful and physically doing, you know, take, killing people or saving their lives. Those are two opposite things in the ethic of, uh, of that, you know, of physical, right? But even verbally killing someone in a sense and mentally imagining them being killed and, and willing them to do, be killed mentally, these are negative ethical acts. Therefore, it leaves a strong imperative on a Buddhist to try to learn to manage their thoughts. So now mind, so that's ethics, is uh, interpersonal action. Then mind is developing stronger powers of self-awareness and self-transforming concentration. So the mind part means understanding how your mind works, using mindfulness, what people nowadays call mindfulness, or what literally they call memory, uh, like attention to your state of mind, remembering that you're thinking, remembering that you are who you are that is thinking and so forth. So inversely, in, inverting your attention in a way and putting it within what is how your mind is functioning. That would be sati or smriti or mindfulness, what people now call mindfulness. And so that's mind. And finally, wisdom, although, although, and then mind also includes not only that becoming more aware, but then also learning to like focus your mind very powerfully on a single issue, on a single investigation, on, on, you know, first of all, not be carried away by involuntary thinking, distracting thinking all the time. That's part of what mindfulness leads you to. But the other one is developing the ability to focus intently on any one particular one that you choose to focus on, to try to use your mind to shape your reality, in fact, actually. And there's a ma no limit, actually, as to what they've discovered by the, a long scientific and technological tradition of doing that. Finally, so mind is developing stronger powers of self-awareness and self-transforming concentration. Finally, wisdom is the understanding of reality itself. The confidence in the possibility of understanding the world, that one could become enlightened, awakened and enlightened, if one succeeds in the education as to how to control negative habits of body, speech and mind, how to broaden awareness and sharpen insight, and how to explore the nature of reality, this is only a provisional belief seeking confirmation or disconfirmation by your own experience. So in other words, the fact that you believe you could become a Lama, that there is such a thing, which you actually maybe can imagine, or even that takes effort. Imagine having a completely different awareness where, for example, you are aware of this room from all the conceivable angles at once including from an awareness that was microscopic, like inside the atoms in the room, and as well, and macroscopic, seeing yourself from how the room looked from the moon, you know, as well as from the dimension, from the, from the angle or the location or the perspective of particular experiencers of the room, and know all of that simultaneously. If you can imagine being like that, which is amazing, you know, it's like if you were dream in a dream, you're just caught up in whatever's happening and just reacting to it. But if you were aware that it was a dream, then suddenly you would be much more in charge of what was going to happen to you. you know? And so similarly, this, they say that if we become more enlightened, that the way we are normally experiencing sitting here, being in this room, talking, reading from this book, would seem like a kind of sleepwalking activity to us which uh, then people naturally thought that that meant, well, then you wouldn't do any such thing of reading, so you'd just be floating in some meditation. And the met some people did, did think that. But then the, 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 the kicker is, the non-dualistic kicker, is that you could still be here and read and talk and be in the room and even make some mistaken mistakes in your perception and yet be fully aware that all that is happening at the same time. And therefore changing completely the quality of how you experience all these things. But that's hard to imagine. It's indescribable, right? Okay. So the confidence, therefore, therefore, the confidence in the possibility of understanding the world, this is what really became, made me a student and a disciple of the Buddhist tradition, uh, the great philosophers Nagarjuna, uh, Dharmakirti, 
a t-shirt on cap uh you know Sakya Panita who have all the great many geniuses in this particular civilizational strand because they all say not only can you understand yourself and the world but if you want to have a happy time you have to if you don't know who you are and where you are and what is the point of it all it will be impossible for you to be really happy this really grabbed me it was what i was looking for that point as a, up until when i was a junior in college this is what i was looking for and that fun around 2021 midlife crisis at 2021 i recommend it <laughs> don't wait till you're 40 41 only might have another one then but don't wait for that because at that time you may want to have a revolution in how you see your life but you know you don't have you, you're not a, as quick a learner at that time it's hard for you to shift it's not impossible you can always you're always learning until i'm still learning it in the 80s but it's harder whereas at 20 you can still learn a lot if you re if you reshift your priorities so it's a good time to have a, a midlife crisis okay so uh so that one could become enlightened if one succeeds in the education as to how to control negative habits of body speech and mind broaden awareness and sharpen insight and explore the nature of reality this is only a provisional belief initially seeking confirmation or disconfirmation by your own experience so you know you're not going on dogma that oh you can and you must be enlightened you're just saying if you could be and it would be better than the way you're unenlightened then you might try it out but you're not yet fanatically even believing that you can be on the other hand that you encourage that you could be if you have a kind of affinity about it and if your common sense is not crippled by some dogma that you cannot understand and things so of why try then it makes sense to you because you'd have changed your perceptions and your habits and so forth but it's a process it's a process You know education doesn't mean you just sign up pay some fee and then boom you have the knowledge of chemistry you have the knowledge of physics you have the knowledge of psychology you have the knowledge of literature no you accumulate this knowledge through a process and in addition you learn to cultivate a mind a meditative mind a one pointed mind and you develop a kind of athletic or a yoga of how to balance your whole mind body complex in the process of doing that to aid you in doing that because it's very the coaching is very thorough body speech and mind in the the educational coaching is not just the mind not just the intellect and it's definitely strongly is the intellect and then it's also the speech and then it's also the mind it's also it's also the body the yoga of that all three Buddhism as a religion is wonderful for some so the one six where it's a religion is those people who were numerous perhaps more numerous than the ones who actually were doing the education those people who supported them to do the education who were in their larger community and believed that what they were doing was good and believed that the enlightened people were enlightened and therefore were kind of holy and they were worthy of supporting and worthy of of studying with and emulating and so on you know that 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 for those people maybe there was a sort of they because they were not able to go through the transformative education they were agricultural societies only small minorities were educated and so on of course it's very different today you know but but in those days in those ancient countries all those people you could say considered it a kind of religion and they pretty much fitted in with their confucianism in china their shamanism in the southeast asian countries their hinduism in in india and or shamanism in depending on different india being very multifarious multicultural or from ancient time melting pot from ancient time and um, then the early time in the west you would in the form of manichaeism and things like that they got along with christianity and zoroastrianism as well so uh some forms of that i say but it was later became a heresy for those forms that didn't want to go along with other traditions so and so anyway it's a, it's wonderful for some but will not by itself get one to the evolutionary summit of nirvana or buddhahood 
which is humanity's optimal condition, which we're thinking of trying to imagine with our realistic worldview on the basis of negation, of, of anybody saying that's impossible, they, with an infinite reference, they can't say that. Anything is possible. It's just a matter of being able to imagine. You can do anything that you imagine if you are capable of imagining it. However, Buddha's threefold super education in life, mind, and science will get one to a deeper personal sanity and an appropriate public civility and adaptability on planet Earth, no matter what one's religious home. And so this, by doing this, this is how His Holiness Dalai Lama sees it, that if you take Buddhism out of being some sort of a competitive, rigid belief system and a sort of dog dogma-driven community, community, exclusivist community, and if you make it an educational project process of bringing out the intelligence and sensitivity and ethical decency of a human being, which is the ideal of an educational process, then it, it doesn't have... That's why it didn't conflict really that much with Hinduism or that much with Confucianism or Taoism or whatever or Manichaeism and Zoroastrianism, you know, Buddha, Christianity in that form. It got along with them well. Today it can get along. You have Jew boos, Chris boos, not so much Muslims, but not from the Buddhist side. There's not exclusivists, but the other traditions, if they are exclusivists, of course, they don't want to get along with, with um, the, the, that education system. They will resist that education system. And in a way, our modern, this is the good part about our scientism or the, the modern secularism, is breaking away from the dogmatic, um, faith-based uh, society of the Middle Ages through the Renaissance and et cetera, up to the Enlightenment, and beginning to observe reality and nature, looking at it in a fresh way, for initially as not anti-God, and eventually as an anti-God thing when it became more dramatic, the resistance within the exclusivist religious tradition. So Buddhism anticipated in dealing with the native religions in Asia and even Iran in the ancient time, Buddhism already anticipated what secularism, secular scientific is trying to do, and it, but it did it without becoming a scientistic neo-materialist religion, which is what we call scientism, which is where we're a little bit stuck. I'm sure there were some people who did get into that. In fact, we won't say it didn't, but... Some people did, but the majority did not, luckily. So therefore, they, 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 were, they were able to coach our current secularists of how an educationalist, of how to use this educational tradition, sophisticated, uh, personal character developing educational institution and intelligence cultivating educational institution uh, without conflicting necessarily with religious organizations, although it will, in fact, over time, it will erode the rigidity of the exclusivism of those traditions, which will be a good thing. Someone who was born in the Christian tradition by heritage and who was trained by Dalai Lama, not only about Buddhism, but also to be completely, not only tolerant, but even respectful to that birth tradition of mine. I can say that there are some dogmatic tenets of that tradition that lead it to wish to conquer other intellectual and philosophical and scientific systems. And those are counterproductive in the planet today. And they are just theological interpretation and they can be reorganized to make it very, very devoted and very still powerful as a vehicle of personal sanctity, developing personal sanctity and personal personal perspicacity, let's say, and yet uh, not be so exclusivistic, be able to see how the same goal could be achieved by someone who wasn't doing it through Jesus, but doing it through Moses or doing it through Muhammad or Kizr or doing it through Buddhism or Hinduism or Taoism or Confucianism or whatever, it's even secular humanism, whatever other way. And this is where we have to get, where we mutually cooperate and consider we're working in harmony and in collaboration between world traditions. This is, this is the goal. So way back before I went back to graduate school, Geshe Wangyad Da told me that I should focus on language, linguistics, and science, and that my work in the future would have to do with Buddhist science, and that is really true. And it has to do with trying to help 
modern people overthrow dogmatic scientism and get back to good old observational, anti-dogmatic, empirical science. That's what we want to be back with, not dogmatic scientism projecting dogmatic worldview. Like the other day, I heard that wonderful Neil deGrasse Tyson, who is following in the footsteps of Carl Sagan, and he was saying in some context, I think it was a segment from a larger talk taken on Instagram, and he was saying, and you don't come from anywhere when you're born. He's sort of into getting into genetics and biological. And he's saying, you had no previous existence at all to being born. And you just don't. And that's it. And you don't. And he kept like saying, like it was repeating a dogma. The more if he's more firmly, he said, don't, that seemed to carry weight. But actually, he didn't give evidence for that. Well, what makes you think that, him think that? Who is he referring to when he says you to a living person? Well, of course your personality was not like it is this life from another, another one. But there is no evidence for the life. In fact, there's a great deal of evidence that there is such a thing as previous life of conscious human being. There's a great deal of evidence that there is. It isn't just a bunch of genes that, are, that transmit from life to life. But he was just dogmatically asserting, just like any inquisitional priest, you have to accept that or you're not a modern person, you're not part of our community. Exclusivist idea. No, you just don't know, you don't know, you don't. Why he was emphasizing that, maybe he watched a few too many Buddhist movies, I don't know. But it's a minority view, that view, because that means you came from nothing. And, and in a way, you're just an illusion produced by your, as an epiphenomenon of your brain. And therefore, actually, you don't exist already. So in that sense, they agree with Buddhist selflessness, but they're taking it too far into a nihilistic level. If you have selflessness in a relational level, your self as a relational process could have been going on beginninglessly as well as having no beginning. Either one could be just as a dogmas. So then look into it and get look at all the evidence for memory of children who have memory of previous life and demonstrate it irrefutably in many, many documented cases with no, um, you know, suspected motive of getting anything out of it because they're in cultures where it's not considered a big deal. It's considered common sense. So, but that's the kind of dogmatism I'm talking about, the way he was doing that. No, you just don't. No, you don't. Not actually, you might think so, but you don't. Those were not extra, he wasn't adding any reasons. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't go on to say, where do you come from? He just talked about how some genes do this, some chromosomes do that, you know, blah, blah, you know, sperm and egg, you know, whatever. It's just a, just a biological robotic process, according to him, you know. But he, has, he, has not, he doesn't stand outside the process to be able to, be able to say that with absolute conviction like that, no way. But he, you know, never mind. Okay, so, but that's very important. So Buddhist science. So later, after I received my doctorate, he and the Dalai Lama commissioned me to translate, without pay, I would say, <laughs> to translate the Tibetan collection of the Buddhist science texts preserved from the lost great Indian Buddhist universities, a collection known as the Tenjur, literally Tibetan for scientific treaties in translation, these texts are a 1,500-year codification of the wisdom knowledge that can govern our behavior and interaction with our surrounding animate and inanimate relativities and can liberate us from our mental and physical suffering. Wow. So this is a huge library. In a way, I always like to say that the greatest of the libraries was some a library called the Ocean of Jewels, which was a nine-story building with hundreds of thousands of texts in it catering to a university of over 10,000 people uh, with many lay people, a larger community of people using its facilities for learning and so on. And uh, that was burned in the 12th, in the 1172, finally, and uh, by some invaders. And uh, the recovery of its, mo its major texts, 4,000, almost 5,000 of them, uh, from Tibetan, very accurate and very over centuries developed translations, is like a major thing. If it was the Library of Alexandria that was being dug up in Ethiopian translations, let's say, just as an analogy, there would be no problem. There would be huge funds and governments competing and scholars doing it. 
and it would be a major operation in Western society because they considered the Library of Alexandria was the great library of its ancient source. And so, but this one has more loss, and it's only the Tibetans who are bringing our attention, bringing the world's attention back to a wonderful thing they are doing. As the original, so, and this this is like a DSM, you know, like the psychology people, psychiatry people have a thing called the DSM, uh, Directory of uh, Symptom uh, something. I forgot what it means, DSM. But it's all the it's all the analyses of different mental diseases. It's the idea, and uh, it's many dozens of or even dec tens of volumes, and um, and this is like a DSM for the hu human psycho how to cure the human psychosis to prevent all kind of violence and suffering, and sickness. As the original founder of the Buddhist inner science tradition that transformed Tibet. Buddha was compelled by his awakening to reality to serve humanity as an educator, not as a religious prophet, because he knew that you cannot be liberated through blind faith, but only through experiential knowledge, wisdom, in the form of wisdom, you know, experiential wisdom. And blind faith particularly means believing in something that you can't see and you can't know, and you have a theory that you can't know it, so you believe it anyway. Uh, it doesn't make sense, but you believe it. That's very bad for you, according to... You can, there is such a thing, a good thing can be a kind of faith that is practical faith, which has common sense supporting it. That's very good, that kind. But uh, not blind faith. But anyway, education is the process that brings that deep wisdom forth, leads it forth, as in the Latin, educere. A means out of, and ducere means lead it out from within your human intelligence and your sensitive heart. Dalai Lama emphasizes how to educate the heart as well as the brain, as the mind. He's very big on that. To emphasize the religious belief component cannot liberate you from suffering because only wisdom can liberate you from suffering. As the great, and then why is that? Believing something just confirms your subjugation to what you believe in. You know, and and that and you you're still depending on something that you believe in, so therefore it can't liberate you because you're rebinding yourself to someone. But therefore, religion doesn't really usually talk about liberation. Indian religion does actually, and various mystical things in the Abrahamic traditions do, and Taoism does, but mostly they don't, because they think you have to depend on something else to save you from suffering, someone else because you don't have the freedom to do it yourself. As the great 8th century Indian philosopher and sage Shantideva says in his Entering the Way of the Enlightening Hero, everything Bodhicharya Vatara, that is, way of the Bodhisattva people will call, everything the Buddha taught was for the sake of wisdom, because that's what frees people. Because it, and frees you is realizing that you are free, actually. You actually already are free. You feel very bound and you're very tied up by this and that. But if you really find out your real true nature, you realize that you are free and that you're making choices all the time and you can choose to do different things. And therefore, when you make choices, you're responsible for the results of those choices. And that gives you the motive to want to shift what your choices are from lesser good, from worse to better causes. Okay? Everything the Buddha taught was for the sake of wisdom. Everything boils down to salvation coming from your own sharp intelligence and your own experiential knowledge, your own wisdom. So knowledge is kind of like data, facts, you know, things you remember that you saw, whereas wisdom is knowing what their nature is, knowing what they really are. It's like knowledge could be seeing your reflection in a mirror, and then wisdom is correcting that it isn't another person looking like you through a window, but it's just a reflection. It seems to be that because that's the way you reflect yourself in the mirror, simply reversing left and right. But uh, but otherwise you you're getting the you, it's useful to you to see yourself reflected for whatever you're doing shaving or putting on your lipstick or whatever you may be doing, okay. So 
That's wonderful. Again, as my final slogan, and after 60 years of working with it, quote Buddhism, unquote, just seems to be realism. Buddhism is realism. That's my motto. Actually, that, from that sentence, the editors wanted me to use that as a title, which isn't bad, actually. No need to worry about religion for or against. Just be realistic. It's just the, quote, A, unquote, the alpha principle. Nowadays, I just want to shout it from the rooftops. Of course, to get the impact of that, you have to know that Buddha discovered that the, quote, reality, unquote, you're being realist realistic about is the bliss you're looking for. <laughs> this is the Buddha's discovery of the total energy of the universe. What is the the overwhelmingly powerful energy of the universe. What is it? What is it that? What is the life force? What is the? What is the reality force? Okay. Is it? Gra is it just gravity? Is it just electricity? Is it just thermal energy? Is it just uh, what else? Uh, electromagnetism, gravity, and whatever else it is. Heat. You know, fire. No. It isn't, it isn't only that. It's something even bigger than all of that. And what is that? The Westerners have discovered now the, the observing people brilliantly have overthrown their own dogmas by deciding that the universe could be as much as 97% invisible matter and energy that they have not yet encountered, but it must be 95% <laughs> to explain the behavior of the 3% that they do encounter, which which is lit up, so to speak. So the invisible stuff, dark or transparent, as I prefer, uh, that then agrees with Buddha. Buddha discovered the transparency of the infinite energy of the universe, that it's it's invisible, but and it's it, it not only it's a hundred percent actually, it it can be congealed into what's visible by by conscious effort on the part of beings. But actually, in itself, it is invisible. It, it's livable, but not visible. Because the seeing process is, is it also. Therefore, it's not an object for the subjective experience or seeing. Well, we'll come back to that. It's very difficult, I know. So, yeah, the Alpha. Buddha was overjoyed to discover that the real reality is bliss. The bliss energy of perfect freedom. Now, bliss is a complicated expression. It isn't just happiness, although, of course, we are always happy when we feel bliss. But bliss is kind of a release from any sense of obstruction, any sense of uh, you know pressure or pain, and even the sort of temporary uh, pleasure-pain cycle where there may be a bit of pleasure, which is the release and the bliss part, but then the, it's immediately strangled by the fact that it doesn't last, and that and even the mind's expecting it not to last also strangles it. And um, so, but the bliss is that part where you just kind of let go of something. That's why what we call the deepest one. You can call it orgasmic bliss, because that's where a being lets go of their sense of control of their body, uh, other than just being unconscious. They, that's also a kind of bliss of falling asleep for an insomniac. It's totally is a bliss too. Uh, but, uh, but then you're just unconscious, you know. Whereas bliss is the moment of slipping into that, releasing the obstruction of feeling tired and yet awake and thinking in your mind and so on. And then you release all that and the release part is the bliss. And so bliss is that release part. And then, but then how can we imagine it? We cannot really imagine being in a conscious state of bliss of total freedom and feeling that that's our real life force and that's where that's our that's where our life is and that's what we are that seems unbelievable to us in a way if it were possible it seems highly attractive to us of course it definitely would be a very very attracting to us and therefore in buddha's first teaching he did say that although you're having a really hard time and you're going to have it as long as you have a deluded way of perceiving life there's a cause of that which you can come to understand. And when you fully understand it, 
you really will discover reality, and that reality is nirvana, which means the cessation of any kind of suffering, the extinguishing, the extinction of suffering, misunderstood even within Asia by other people, by some people, and by many people who became enlightened beings eventually, but initially misunderstood it as meaning that you have to extinguish life in order to reach this state of bliss. That therefore, it's like a promise of a beyond that is blissful. And there is a form of Buddhism that still thinks that today, actually. But the more, the more amazing one that, we're, that was, became much majority up until, as long as Buddhism was allowed to flourish in Asia up until about eight, 900 years ago. And that is that um, there's a way to be here like that. So to realize your deepest level of being here at the same time as cope with your relational, interrelational level, and even fully engage in that interrelational level by feeling that it's always the bliss. Its reality is always the bliss, and having that simultaneously, and therefore inconceivably when we try to explain it in dualistic language, but simultaneously present, okay? So he was overjoyed. Therefore, the experiential knowledge of that reality of the reality of the bliss energy of perfect freedom. Therefore, the experiential knowledge of that reality is also bliss. Body and soul. One merges with it. One surrenders to it, you could say. One melts into the bliss that is released from suffering. One can even say reality is only thoroughly known by bliss. Subjectivity itself melted into bliss. Thoroughly knowing it is being it. Ignorance or misknowledge or misknowing of reality is not bliss. It is self-entrapment in separation, a state of alienation that faces all the seemingly insoluble problems. Misknowing, misperception, misunderstanding, these cause suffering. They are suffering. Luckily, misknowing is never total as knowing is always coming through in the inadvertent, intuitive, and all too often unnoticed sparkles around the edges of our entrapment in this so seemingly solid world. It's always a little sparkle that the poet always finds. She always sees some the other, Emily Dickens, and she always sees a little jewel and the dewdrop on the, on the leaf, on the leaf of the flower of the mint the julep plant in the garden, you know. She sees that sparkle around the edges. Buddha's discovery of reality was his experience of nirvana, pure freedom. On that happy morning, and this is a pure freedom, which doesn't mean you extinguish your sensitivity, you extinguish your awareness. You extinguish your entrapment in only one kind of dualistic subject-object awareness where the subject is an intrinsically, absolutely real separate thing from the object, which is an intrinsically, absolutely real objective thing, and both are obstructing each other, actually, confronting and obstructing each other, both of them. And that, you see through that one, and that's where the bliss is. And when you see through that one, then you and the object are one thing. And, and yet you still can discern it as, a, as if it were a separate thing, and you can relate to it. You don't just have to melt into where you're only it, or it's only you. You and it are both you and it, as both one and not one at the same time. Therefore inconceivable and inexpressible in a dualistic yes or no binary symbol system, right? So on that happy morning when he fully awoke from misknowing and fully expanded his being through blissful knowing as infinite interbeing, a wonderful term of Thich Nhat Hanh, the great, the great Vietnamese Zen master, enlightened being, enlightening hero, he exclaimed, Buddha Shakyamuni did, deep peace, clear light or transparency, non-proliferating, and uncreated. I have found the one reality like the deathless elixir. So this was his first, uh, this uh, half a quatrain was his first thing that he said upon 
becoming enlightenment dawning in him, the non-dualistic enlightenment dawning in him, that he has experienced something that's oneness, that is deep, peaceful, luminous, transparent, uh, non-proliferating and un or non-complicating and, and uncreated. Therefore, it's a reality that I didn't make up. Nobody made it up. It's just always been there. It's infinite. It's completely inconceivable. But it is everything. And you can only melt into it by kind of, you, in a way, using, using your inference of the, to, about its invisibility to become its invisibility, something like that. Nothing, nothing I say can really convey it to you fully, but all the negations that I can use around it will open your mind toward its possibility and eventually its, its kind of experience. Maybe it's not concrete. Maybe it's more flowing experience. Uh, but maybe there's no difference at that other time. So then wisdom now, and therefore it's, wisdom is bliss and misknowing is not, just to emphasize, then I go ahead. Luckily, so when we know total reality, we know total bliss. And then that's, an, that's an exponential bliss. So it's that released feeling forever because there's infinite obstruction and then infinite release going on all the time. Infinite other beings, we are, we are releasing, we are feeling one with all the other beings, we are, find, we are helping them find release and then feeling their release. And so the release goes in a cascade ripple. Like our own enlightenment is like a stone plopping in the middle of a stream and the ripples of going out are other people sharing the same melting into ultimate reality, finding their bliss when you really fully find it. You become like that stone in the pond, you know. Luckily, to experience wisdom is bliss, ignorance not so much. Luckily, to experience reality as suffering is just a mistake. It's just a mistake. Well, actually, we'll stop there. We'll stop this one. When we know true reality, we know total bliss. Okay, Adam. Ding!